Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to episode four of Constellation Crew this semester. I'm Madeline Shepley, your host here and a grad student here at Ball State University. And I am joined by Nicolette Terracciano and Caleb Whitcomb, both undergraduates here at Ball State. How's everyone doing today? Hey, good. Great. Awesome. Hopefully you guys aren't too sleepy because we have a great, great program for everyone tuning in. Um, you guys uh, listening in might have noticed that we are on at a very, very early time compared to usual, and that is because we now have public shows again this semester, so we decided that we didn't want to deprive you of Constellation Crew and we rescheduled. So now we can have, we will be here every uh, Friday at 1030. So hopefully you enjoy waking up with us. Now, as per usual for, uh, but for those of you who are new to this whole game, we are using this software called Stellarium. And Stellarium is this free program that allows us to explore the night sky from here on Earth. So no need to blast off into space, buy anything fancy. You can do this for free and join us. If you ever want to explore it yourself, the link is in our post so that you can download it if you so choose. Now, um, you might be wondering what are we doing for uh, our program today? And uh, since it's been a little while, we kind of wanted to remind you of what the night sky looked like and give you a little bit of a tour as to what you might be able to see. So right now we have uh, our Stellarium put on uh, Muncie, Indiana and at a time just, just before sunset on our uh, day today. So anything that we show you tonight, you'll be able to go see when you get home from work or whatever it is you do during the day. So with all of that out of the way, um, we, before we get into that, we wanted to talk about this cool, uh, astronomical event that, uh, happened on last weekend. So Nicolette, can you tell us about that? Yes, I can. So March 20th was like Madeline said, a pretty awesome astronomical event. And I think it's actually pretty cool. We had our spring equinox. Ooh, uh, spring equinox. Mm. What is that? So to begin with, I always love to know where certain words come from. It's always been a thing of mine since I was a kid. And equinox is a formation of two Latin words that separately mean equal and night. So you can imagine sense. that this probably has something to do with daylight and equality of like how much daylight and nighttime light nighttime light we have um, that was a very awkward way of saying i mean it. there is light during the night you've got the stars the moon yeah. what have you okay there we go okay i like that thanks for redeeming me um <laughs> i i always got your back nicola you know that thank you so what this really means is that we have equinoxes and solstices so we have a summer solstice and a winter solstice and then we have a fall equinox and a spring equinox. And the seasons on our home planet are actually dictated by the Earth's tilt. And that also coincides with the solstices and the equinoxes. So when we go back to the origin of the two words equal and night, the Earth's tilt is giving us equal amounts of light. So if you can imagine my hand is the Earth here, we're face we're more tilted this way so we're getting direct sunlight evenly and we're then we're getting equal amounts of daylight and equal amounts of nighttime light or nighttime equal amounts of daytime yeah. and nighttime that's really interesting because i feel like a lot of people have the misconception that it's all about like where the earth is in its orbit but that's actually not true that is not true um but it's something that 
I, I actually was told that when I was very little by in my elementary classes that that's how the seasons were dictated. But it is the tilt and it's actually quite fascinating if you guys want to um, browse on the internet, there are plenty of wonderful web pages that can give you a better visual of these tilts. So for a summer solstice, for example, the earth is tilted more towards the sun. So the top part of the earth, um, depending on your location, so since it is a tilt, um, we experience up here um, in the northern hemisphere summer solstice, and then while we're experiencing our summer solstice, the southern hemisphere is experiencing their winter solstice because we're experiencing direct sunlight from the top, and they're experiencing less sunlight on the bottom. So basically, so if I if I got on a plane during the summer solstice in the northern hemisphere, and I flew to say Australia. I could experience like two seasons in like the course of like 24 hours. <laughs> I I would imagine so. I would Not... say so. But it is it is still kind of different because if I remember correctly, you know, it's hotter towards the equator and I don't have a globe in my brain and I'm not quite sure how close Australia is to the equator. But I always know that it is pretty hot there and it doesn't get very cold as far as I know or at least Maybe I'll fly to Antarctica instead. <laughs> there we go. That, that, well, I think you have a question for you, Nicola, about, about the equinox and area of the solstice. Like, I've heard the like uh, the like um, equinox and the solstice is more like the start of the season. I mean, is that true? Because I mean, you know, like you know, like when the summer solstice comes around, it, it feels it already feels like well before that's already pretty warm. So, right. So, the solstices are kind of a marking of calendars. Um, a lot of uh, cultures across the world have used the solstices and equinoxes as a timetable for oh, yeah. farming, for holidays, all kinds of stuff. We actually did talk about a holiday a couple episodes ago. Yeah, that, I, yeah. didn't we talk about this during the uh, Celtic astronomy episode? Yes, yes like, we did. It was all yeah. over like my notes, Caleb's notes, Greg's notes too, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. So we experienced the spring equinox, but here in Muncie, even today, it is barely 40 degrees and it's very cold. So I am sad to report that just because the equinox happened, it does not mean that we're going to spike to 80 degrees. See, <laughs> see but I guess more... I don't have to um, actually fly to Antarctica to go experience another season in 24 hours. I just got to <laughs> live in the Midwest. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. I, it, so I've it's more. Like, I've heard mm -hmm. terms like midsummer, midwinter. You know, I'm like, so, yeah. yeah, like, I mean. So it's more of an astronomical event rather than a weather event or seasonal event. It's more of a astronomical event because it's all about the earth being tilted towards or away or equally in this case to the sun. Yeah. So that's all really cool. Now, mm -hmm. um, you were telling me earlier that there are actually some other misconceptions that people have about the equinoxes. So can you tell me about that, Nicolette? Yes. So very quickly, we um, I remember back when the pandemic first started, a lot of people were trying to balance a broom on the equinox. And I walked out of my dorm and there were brooms everywhere, <laughs> everywhere. People stumbling oh, over man. brooms and trying to balance them because it's the idea that you can only balance a broom or an egg on the equinox. Sadly, this is a misconception. It's not, you can balance a broom or an egg any day of the year. Just requires just some a, skill, right? Yes, some skill and some practice. But it's just a misconception that since again, we go back to the origin of those two words, right? And say, and we know that it's equal and night. So a lot of people believe that there's an equal force of gravity between the sun and the earth only on the equinoxes. And therefore that's why you can only balance an egg or a broom on the equinoxes, but that is not true. In fact, the sun has very little effect on how you balance an egg here on earth. The earth has more force of gravity on the egg than anything else, but you can Especially balance an egg. Especially because of the proximity and what is it? The inverse square law or something like that. I, yes, it's gravity is technical. an inverse square law. Right? Me, the inverse square law is our friend. <laughs> yeah, it's, friend. <laughs> it's like all over astronomy. It's not even funny. Yes. So, really, and honestly, I haven't seen a lot of people across social media balance things like laptops 
on the corner. They open up the laptop and then they balance it on the corner. They've balanced mugs. So really, like Madeline said, takes a lot of practice and skill and maybe even some physics knowledge if you so wish. Yeah, I, uh, I don't know about you, but I definitely don't have those kinds of skills. I've seen <laughs> I've seen people who like who who are dancing. They rotate they 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 rotate themselves on the ground on their head. You know, so yeah, yeah, exactly. But it's a fun little thing, and quite frankly, it was the funniest thing to see in the pandemic when everyone was trying to balance a broom on social media. It was very funny and really enjoyable. It brought us kind of together at that time. So it was really fun. Yeah, definitely. You see a lot of interesting things on social media. I never cease to be amazed. Right? <laughs> yeah. So that was kind of cool. Now you guys all know uh, about the Equinox, thanks to Nicolette. But um, now we can get into the true meat of the program, which is why we're called Constellation Crew in the first place. So we are going to, um, since it is spring now, technically, we are going to talk about some uh, constellations that you can expect to see in the night sky for the next few months. And so, uh, Caleb, why don't you tell us about our first constellation? All right. Um, if we go to nights, um, if we look at the night sky, um, well, our first constellation is a, is a, is a very, is, is a, it can it possibly be very seen pretty well. It's a you know, you first want to go I think to uh, Orion, um, right. so, uh, um, the constellation Orion, which uh, and uh, if you uh, let's let's wait for it to pull up. Uh, there we go, my man Orion. Yep. <laughs> now Orion is one of one of the most uh, you know. Easily recognizable because in the sky, if uh, you know, you, you just tell by the by the three stars' belt right there. Now, if we go a little uh, west from that, we uh, um, we will notice what's uh, what seems to appears to be looks like a backwards question mark in the sky. You're making me earn my money today. <laughs> there we go. We got our little question mark here. Yep. And that actually is a constellation um, that actually a lot of people might actually know the name of. It's actually the constellation known as Leo the Lion. Any um, fans of the Lion King out here? <laughs> oh, my favorite. Oh, I love that movie. Thank uh, you, Caleb. But like, yes, uh, Thank yeah, you. Leo the Lion. And uh, yeah. and um, if you actually pull up what the constellation looks like in a in a in what an artist would think of that, we can actually see what actually it looks like. So. Uh, Mind if we add? There, we got some uh, lines. Yep. So uh, this actually is uh, Leo is actually one of actually one of what's known as the constellations of the zodiac. Um, what is the zodiac? Oh yeah, I'm Our so listener. glad you asked. <laughs> uh, now, some might some of you might have heard the name zodiac before. Zodiac um, over the course of the year, the sun actually traces a path through the sky. Um, and actually, uh, this path is known as what's known as the ecliptic, uh, the, the imaginal line that some path uh, traces through the sky throughout the year. And uh, there are twelve constellations um, that that which through which the ecliptic passes through, and Leo was one of those constellations. So, and it's also you know uh, this, this zodiac is actually also where we get um what what are known as a. Uh, uh, you might have heard of astrological signs. So mm -hmm. you might have heard, you know, like someone say, like, say, I'm a Leo or I'm a Libra or I'm a Gemini. Um, so, yeah, um, astrological signs, you know, come from this zodiac. So, yes. uh, yeah. And uh, Leo actually is, uh, is you know, um, I know, I know. I know Nick left the mythology buff, but I thought I might <laughs> yeah, yeah, say, uh, mention this. Yeah, Leo what, actually, what is the story behind Leo? So Leo is actually um, na named after a mythological beast known as the Nemean Lion, which by its name actually terror was what used to terrorize a, 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 an area called Nemea, which is by the ancient Greek city Corinth. Um, now, um, 
It, some of you might have scourge. heard. Yeah, and actually, he was defeated um, by the by some of you might heard of this guy, the famous hero known as Hercules, um, for one of his uh, twelve labors. Yeah. It was his first 12, 12 labors. And isn't Hercules in the night sky as well, somewhere in a constellation? Yeah, 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 it is actually. Uh, and you know, it's probably he's probably one of the most famous, you know, Greek heroes that you know. Uh, most not most people likely have heard of, especially if you've watched the uh, the Disney movie. <laughs> oh well, see, um, Greg uh, very much loves that movie, and mm -hmm. you can get him on a roll about it. And yeah. he loves it so much that one of his cats is named after yeah. uh, Hercules. So that's cute. You definitely actually, know a lot about that movie. Actually, uh, the, the the way Hercules defeated the naming line. The Nubian line was faded that actually no weapon could pierce its hide. So wow. what Hercules had to do, he had to go in literally into the lion's den and he had to like wrestle with it to defeat it. That and, sounds very dangerous, not gonna lie. Oh yeah. Yeah. Would not uh, recommend unless you're a professional. I would, yeah, I'm not gonna I'm not recommend going into a lion's den and wrestling with it. <laughs> yeah. uh, but Leave like, it to the professionals. And after he defeated the he used its fur as kind of a, a form of armor, basically. So you know. Yeah, that's a so, resourceful guy right there. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> I was just thinking that. So, yeah, and that. And that was just and that was just one of the twelve labors. They're like there's like oh, a, you know whole twelve labors of all these mythical beasts he had to fight. You know. Yeah, he really so, he must have had to take a really long nap after that because that just sounds like a lot of work. Yeah, you know, think about it. You know, think, what if there had been another lion? Like you know, the lions like hunting like you know was it like. Uh, a, a pride so like what if there'd be like a uh, other lions in the there Nemean that would have been pride. really bad oh yikes yeah. that that would be a lot i would not be able to fight the nemean lion and survive Hard oh yeah pass. hercules was a very special kind of guy yeah so. so you know leo is cool and all are there any notable things in leo that people might want to observe actually there is something um if you look um, at the backwards question mark, you look at look, where what you, where do you expect the little dot of the question mark to be? There's a very bright star there, and that star is known as Regulus. Regulus, what a yep. regal sounding name, am I right? Oh yes, actually, in Latin, it translates to uh, little king or prince. Aww. So, oh. Yep. Look at the pearls. Sorry, French. Yep. Oh, <laughs> oh, that book I read in French class in high school. Uh, yeah. Oh, it's actually, it is actually the closest bright star to the ecliptic in the sky. So if you look like that, if you were to put the ecliptic on there, uh, it, it, it would be very close to the ecliptic. Wow. So like almost right on it. So that's pretty um, close. And actually, um, it is a bright star, but actually it's not just one star. It's actually two sets of binary star systems wait it's like four stars yeah it's actually it's actually four different stars in two I like in two different sets of binary star systems let's see if we can see that because i i i don't know if i believe you caleb <laughs> do you know if we could see that with a telescope or binoculars um it had to be a very powerful telescope i'd say okay fair enough Sometimes you're able to do that and see two stars if you have a powerful enough telescope. Okay. You can do it, Stellarium. I need to pause time. <laughs> see, the fun thing about Stellarium is it's kind of like a time machine. And you yeah. can uh, fast forward time, you can uh, not fast forward time, whatever the heck you want. <laughs> yeah. But I guess... Uh, Regulus doesn't want to uh, show that. It's... Yeah, um, I mean, is this part? Of... I guess not. I'm not. I'm not sure actually yet. The two, uh, the four of the star systems actually are two like uh, smaller, very small stars, like uh, low mass stars. So they're, um, mm. so they're dwarf stars. Um, and then this, the 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 one that really makes the most of Regulus actually is like a, is a uh, a pretty fairly young star that's uh I think it's white. It's a white star. Um, and it's actually uh only a few million years old and uh and uh it's uh and the, other, and the other one is actually what they believe to be a white dwarf um so young uh, and an old star yep so so we got age and beauty both in yep. the same uh star 
And for those of you who like me and Nicolette and I mean, maybe Madeline, I, uh, I enjoy what? Yeah, I enjoy Harry Potter. Okay, uh, for those of you who know Harry Potter, Regulus actually is uh, the name is actually the name of a character in Harry Potter who they took from this. Who the author took from the stars, um, from this from from a uh, constellations, and uh, it's actually the the uh, the character known as Regulus Black. Who is who, um, Regulus Black for those who aren't as educated in the Harry Potter world as we are? Oh, so Regulus Black, um, without going into too much detail, um, is actually um, the brother of Sirius Black. Oh. Um, so some of you might, might have heard of. Uh, and what's actually kind of ironic, actually, is that like Regulus Black, um, everyone knows that like the lion is the symbol of Gryffindor. What's interesting is that like uh, Regulus Black actually in the in the books was actually a Slytherin, you know. True. So True. it's actually it's kind of a, a bit of ironic because he was a Slytherin, and you know, and he actually is his his name comes from the, a star in the a constellation of a lion, you know. Maybe he was more like the cowardly lion in uh, the lion, or not the lion, the witch in the, um, oh, the Wizard of Oz. There we go. <laughs> actually, if you, if you, I mean, I'm not gonna spoil anything for you, but like, you read the books. He's actually pretty brave, and actually, he probably would, might have been a better Gryffindor than a Slytherin. Actually, hmm, I might need to go no. reread the books for like the third time to yep. see if <laughs> you are true. So, because I don't remember him maybe being particularly brave. So, I mean, like, serious obviously was Harry <laughs> Hermione Ron. <laughs> But uh, Regulus Black. Hmm. Yeah, um, yeah. So it is, you know, pretty. It's pretty cool, you know. Where or these names, no problem. So and I thought, you know, since we're on the the uh, the the nerd universe, <laughs> I thought another cool star we might we just we could mention is is the star known as Wolf three three five nine. That's in the constellation of Leo. Um, or um, it's um, it's known as C. N. Leonis. So um, this is actually a star. It's very actually extremely dim. I mean, it is very it's very dim, hard to see even with powerful telescopes. And uh, it is actually a uh, one of the closest stars to Earth. And for those of you um, who might who are fans of the famous uh, with the famous uh, series, famous science fiction series Star Trek. It actually is mentioned a couple times in that show. Is so, it really? I don't know if anybody, if anybody here is a Star Trek fan, but like th that, actually, that star is actually mentioned a couple times in the series. Yeah, I. It's kind of funny when like things in like pop culture, you know, show up in science and vice versa. I yeah. know that uh, they went to this uh, random star that didn't want to show its face on Stellarium. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, despite it, it being very close to Earth, it actually is, uh, relatively, it is actually uh, pretty dim, so. Yeah. So, yeah, that's uh, really cool. Well, thank you, Caleb, for telling us all about Leo. So, the You're next uh, constellation we want to talk, I mean, it's technically, it's technically an all-the-time constellation, because I'm pretty sure it's circumpolar. Oh, it but, is? Okay. Er, no, uh, Leo's not circumpolar, but um, our next constellation is, I'm pretty sure. So, Nicolette, why don't you tell us about our next constellation? Okay, so our next constellation is very near and dear to my heart because there's actually a children's book on it, and I'm very sad I can't find it anywhere in my house or on the internet, but I remember it, and it was the Big Bear book, and it was a light-up book, and at the end, you got to push the tail of the bear, and it lit up. And it was about the constellation Ursa Major, or the Big Bear. <laughs> yeah, was... So more a lot of people often associate Ursa Major or the Big Bear with the Big Dipper. However, the Big Dipper is actually called an asterism, which is not a constellation. It's a smaller piece of the bigger puzzle. So a smaller shape of a constellation, but it's still recognized. It's just called an asterism instead of a constellation. So you'll see it here. 
Hello, Big Bear and the Big Dipper. Hello, Big Bear. <laughs> it kind of, oh yeah, it does kind of look like a bear. Yeah, Sorry, if you connect the dots that. the right way, it does. Yes. So Ursa Major actually has some pretty big stuff going on with it currently. If you've been keeping up with the Planetarium Facebook page, you've probably been seeing a lot of Facebook posts about the James Webb Space Telescope. Yep. And just recently, James Webb decided to point to a star that is in the constellation Ursa Major. However, we can't really see it. It's there, but like our wonderful um, show specialist Melanie has said before, sometimes in astronomy, we, let, we like to point telescopes to what we think is a blank patch of the sky and there's nothing there and there actually is something there. Yeah. <laughs> Hubble definitely like uh, was a pioneer in that. Yeah. Because I think exactly. that's how you get the Hubble Deep Field is oh yeah patch of like, uh, blank sky and lots of like stars and galaxies over there. Exactly. So James Webb decided to go there because it needed something that w ne it needed something to focus on to see if everything was working right, if it was able to find stars appropriately. So if we were to tell James Webb, hey, go to Polaris, we need to make sure that it'll actually go to Polaris. So in this case, it um, we told James Webb to go to this star and it took a wonderful picture. Um, and it was just kind of one of the first images that we've gotten other than again on the facebook page you can see james webb's selfie that it took of itself which is pretty cool so there's still not much going on because james webb just kind of unfolded itself just recently and is trying to align everything but we'll eventually start getting actual data and images and such um in the summer i believe in june and july of yeah. this summer the after years and years of delays, we eagerly await the uh, first science images and proof that um, we, you know, did this right and that James Webb is working. Yes. So it's a very it's a very interesting star. I am happy to know that it's around. It may not be very bright and it's a sun like star, but it's awesome that it now has a place in our history with it being involved with. James Webb Space Telescope. Awesome. Well, um, Ursa Major is very, very cool. Fortunately, I believe we talked about it in other episodes, but it was nice to learn some more fun information about Ursa Major. Mm. Now, uh, we had some other constellations planned, but uh, I know we oh. all have class to go to, so we want to since winter is leaving us, we want to make sure that we give a proper send off to some constellations we're not going to see for a little bit. So, Caleb, would you mind talking about our first winter constellation that we're going to say goodbye to? Uh, yeah. Um, so, um, one of the constellations we're going to be saying goodbye to is uh, the the famous constella uh, constellation known as uh, K uh, Canis Major. And actually, it's uh, if you look uh, straight west of uh, of of Orion, you see it's a very you see a very bright star. It's brighter than any other star in the sky, and that's actually one of the main the brightest star in the constellation of Canis Major, known as uh, Sirius. Which going to Hendrick, I know what, I I keep trying to get back to Harry Potter. But like, the, this is Sirius we Black should just call this film. the Harry Potter episode, honestly. Oh yeah, we should just call it that. Uh, but like yeah, I mean Sirius. You know, takes his take the, the character Sirius Black takes the name from this the the star known as Sirius, which actually is known as the Dog Star. Which, if you know Harry Potter, Sirius Black can turn into a big dog. It's you know? a real canine star. Yep. And actually, a little fun fact is that like uh, um, in the ancient in the ancient Roman times, uh, before when Sirius was right, Sirius would rise um before the sun in the hottest days of summer. So actually, they called those days the dog days so that's that's likely where we get I, I, I'm, I'm not sure exactly but that, I, I think that's where we get the, the term the dog days of summer see yes. whenever I think of dog days I think did it, either of you guys ever read uh Diary of a Wimpy Kid oh and, yeah well my brother did <laughs> like, yeah. dog days. So my brother and my parents weren't thrilled about that but yeah. I know one of them is one of them is called the dog days of summer or something yeah. like that 
Yay. I really used to carry those books around all the time. <laughs> uh, that seems very on brand for you, Caleb. I don't know why, but it does. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I mean, I'm, I mentioned this in a previous show before, but my name actually translates in Hebrew to dog. So <laughs> I did not know that. So that's really funny. Yeah. So, and my favorite animal is a wolf, you know, so. You're just very on brand for our show today, Caleb, and I am 100% here for it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Any other cool things about Canis Major? Um, well, actually, Sirius actually is actually made up of two stars, not just one. Let's see if you, uh, I'm going to check because I don't know if I want to believe you at fact because when we tried to look at Regulus, I didn't see the uh, stars. Come on. Well, I'm not sure you can see because like one of the stars is a white dwarf. So we'll see if we can see it real quick. So it'd be very hard to see the second star because it's a white dwarf. So I guess uh, it doesn't want to uh, hang out with us. Thanks, yeah. Sirius. Oh, man. But Sirius is so nice in the books. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Yep. Oh, I'd say I'd say Lupin is a pretty fun character to be around. I mean, well, at least when it's not the full moon. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're not yeah. wrong. You don't you don't want to go get bitten by a werewolf. That would be unless good. unless you give them the wolf spade potion beforehand. So. <laughs> well, see, they didn't have any foresight. Um, yeah. During all that uh, those happenings, so I love the chapter where like everything's revealed in that book because like everything's you know, all this information dump like you know it's yeah. so much fun you know yeah oh my goodness those uh, you're just bringing just back talk, memories from elementary school forever. man but uh back to uh, Canis Major um actually it is part of um yeah Nicolette mentioned that the Big Dipper is what's known as an asterism. Candace Major is actually part of a, a very large autism known as the Winter Hexagon. Interesting. It actually is comprised of six different constellations. I, I think six different constellations in the winter sky. Hmm. So. Yeah. I didn't know that there's a Winter Hexagon. I knew there was like a summer triangle and a winter triangle. Yeah. But yeah. a hexagon? I'm not, oh, yeah. I'm not ready for that kind of math at this early in the morning. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Canis Major is cooler than we thought. <laughs> but oh yeah, uh, we have. Well, I guess technically one more because I forget where Scorpius is on a sky. But we have one more constellation that we want to make sure that we say goodbye to, and that is my favorite constellation. Which do you guys remember what my favorite constellation is? Um, uh, I think it's Orion. Uh, I'll take a riot for 200, please. <laughs> 200 point instead of minus 20%. <laughs> oh, oh I'm going to leave that down in my... <laughs> I made that joke last night, Caleb, at a plantarian presentation. You would be proud. But yeah. anyways. Just, just, just don't throw any chalk at me, please. <laughs> I won't. I don't have any chalk right now, and I feel like if I threw it at the screen, Dana would be mad at me. But... <laughs> In any case, uh, we want to say goodbye to Orion because, I mean, in my definitely not biased opinion, Orion is the coolest. And uh, since I could talk about for days about Orion, uh, but we don't want me to talk for days and make Nicolette late to class, we're going to have Nicolette talk about some <laughs> cool stuff about Orion. So... Orion is pretty awesome, as Madeline has said. I agree. It's a pretty awesome constellation, but we are going to say goodbye. Now, not goodbye forever. Orion isn't going to just disappear. That would be Orion is just going to be harder to see during certain times of the night, unless you want to wake up very early in the morning. We're not aware uh, of that. Right. So we're going to say goodbye to Orion, but honestly, it is for the best for Orion, because if anyone is familiar with Orion's history and mythology, more specifically Greek mythology, Orion meets his end due to a scorpion. There are many ways of how the scorpion is involved, but the end result is that the scorpion gets Orion. See, you're, you're giving me memories of last time I went, um, 
like when I went to Kitt Peak National Observatory, I uh, saw a scorpion for the first time and thankfully Gosh. I avoided Orion's fate and uh, did not get to <laughs> <by a> scorpion. <laughs> I'm sorry, but all this talk about like mythology is making me think of like uh, reading Percy Jackson and the Olympians when I was younger. Yeah. Oh my okay. goodness, you're just bringing out all of the, uh, the nerd nostalgia. And all yeah, all the nerdiness and all the nostalgia, and I'm just swimming in it right now. <laughs> so we are going to say goodbye to Orion for his own safety, but we're going to say hello to Scorpius. Hello, Scorpius. Scorpius will be joining us for the spring and summer, I believe. We have done a Constellation Crew episode on Scorpius. So if you are at all curious about the Constellation, please feel free to go back on our Facebook page. You can watch any past Constellation Crew videos and you can watch our Constellation Crew video on Scorpius. But we're gonna take a look at him now, if we can see him. Yeah, let me see if, I guess oh. not. Maybe, oh, it's, maybe it's not about time, but like, you know, there's another Harry Potter character who gets his name from this constellation? Maybe his his or her. I know there's a her. Or unless you're talking about Scorpius. If you're talking there about Orion, is. there's a her. Scorpius. Like you know. Uh... There he is. <laughs> you're gonna have to wake up real early in the morning if you want to see Scorpius right now. Oh uh, yeah. So yes. maybe you might want to like wait for a while. Yes, wait a little while longer. But here he is in all his glory. I had a feeling that he was probably a. Uh, under the well not not under the earth but i had a feeling he was probably down there somewhere because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um i think in the mythology zeus purposely like puts orion and scorpius on opposite ends so that yes. um orion doesn't die a second death in the sky exactly he mm -hmm. can always run away he will not have to meet his demise a second time or for all of eternity in this case he mm -hmm. can avoid the scorpion thank goodness yeah is there anything co cool about this uh, duo of constellations? Well, in we know a lot about Orion uh, when it comes to objects, but in one of in one of the stars is another Harry Potter character, which I find extremely fascinating and charming. A lot of people do not like her, but I think she's great. Wonderful character uh -huh. development and character story. Well, development always means something good, but. <laughs> I more mean you get to know her well, and her name is Bellatrix Lestrange. So oh, Bellatrix... she's definitely very strange. Uh, and yes, Helena Bonham I... Carter really like just uh, uh, really yeah. portrays her well. Anyways. I just like uh, she does a really good job. I I just like talking about these constellations. Like you know, like, we're talking about winning constellations. Not the best talk about Harry Potter because like like all the like uh Sirius and his relatives all that the whole family all their names come from constellations <laughs> like that just gets me so happy yeah uh, that was the only reason why like I would I was like dang I wish I had names as cool as that but also it might so in this day and age it might sound a little pretentious to be named after a constellation <laughs> but, but yeah, yeah we got Bellatrix right here yeah. hanging out Yes. So I guess uh, the moral of this uh, episode's uh, story is that uh, there's a lot of uh, Harry Potter references in the spring and uh, winter skies. So <laughs> the more you know. Yes. Oh, I could go on all day oh. with all these Harry Potter, you know, conversation stuff. I, mean, I know. Uh... So speaking... Real quick before we sign off, uh, we talked a lot about constellations, but are there any like planets that we can see this time of year or are we out of luck? Nicolette, do you know about that? I do, and it really depends. I am not a morning person, Neither. not at all. It, it, it is not a good time if you decide to Oops. poke Nicolette the bear very early in the morning. Um, <laughs> but if you are a morning person or you do muster the courage to get out of bed between four, yeah, four or 6 a.m., just around the time before the sun comes up, you will be able to see three planets. We have Venus, Mars, and Saturn. Let's see. So, 
find uh, there, It's going to be very close to the horizon, though, which we will see in a moment. The eastern horizon? Uh, southeastern, yeah, eastern, southeastern. Well, there Yay. we go. There's Venus. Yay! So if you want to get up at 6 a.m., be my guest. And then... Yeah. yeah. I think this at, is at, least, at, least, at least for right now. In some of the future, it'll be... You can see a pod right after sunset, so... Exactly. It is It is a wonderful sight to see, honestly. I have seen Venus and Saturn through a telescope, and both are just amazing sights to see. Yeah. I highly recommend. However, if you're not a morning person, like Caleb said, we thank you very much, Caleb, it. you can wait until the planets start to rise earlier in the evening, so you're not waiting until dawn. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> Nic Nicola, you said you're like a bear in the morning. I am like a sloth. I do not. I I've slept through earthquakes before, so. Oh, I I, I am concerned like for you, Caleb, that you sleep through earthquakes. Well, I mean, like, it, it's not like they were like like you know like magnitude like eight point nine. Be like, but like, I mean, it's Indiana, so it's really it's always minor earthquakes. But like, I have I have I can sleep. Other fall asleep, I can sleep through almost anything. You know. That... Oh, so can I. It's just if you wake the bear. Don't do that. <laughs> You've seen that many times. If anyone remembers the movie Over the Hedge, very old movie. Oh yeah. Love All that movie. Oh, oh my. RJ, oh. RJ woke the bear. Bad oh, idea. <laughs> well, we don't uh, want to wake the bear, and yeah. uh, we don't want to provoke the wrath of uh, Nicolette's uh, professor <laughs> for whatever class she has. So, I guess uh, I'm going to ask if you guys have any other uh, comments before we go. Other than if you'd love some more updates about all things astronomy and science related, or even just James Webb, please feel, feel free to visit our Facebook page. It is awesome and very informative. Um, <laughs> so we have our James Webb stuff there too. There we have our... Uh, social media handles up on the screen and uh that way you can follow everything we do here at the planetarium because uh if you've been paying attention we do some really fun stuff so with that um i hope to, me nicola and caleb we all hope to see you all next time i think next friday is our next episode and until then i hope you guys uh stay starstruck so see you later, guys.